and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good morning. Welcome to those who are watching this TV program this morning to stay with us and be blessed by the preaching of God's Word. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Our text this morning will be in 2 Timothy in chapter 3, and we will begin in verse 14. First of all, we've been teaching on what it was that the church did when they came together on the first day of the week. And we'll go back 2,000 years ago when the church was established. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 42 that those Christians in those days continued steadfastly or they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine and of breaking in bread and in prayers. From that time on, families have come together on the first day of the week. Christian families. Yeah, I'm talking about moms and dads and their children. And they came together. Sometimes people fuss about children making noise uh, in the worship hour. Well, could you imagine being back uh, almost 2,000 years ago and the families, the size of the families that they had, and they came together on the first day of the week to worship their God? How many children they might have? You know, we're talking 5, 10, 15, 20 plus. Can you imagine the noise that was taking place? And it didn't stop those people from worshiping God. Sometimes we've got to be careful in how we do things. I know there are times when uh, uh, noise is being made and it's hard to think and concentrate. But at other times, you know, we have to put up with it. And it's going to be beneficial to the children in the long run, you see. The children need an example today concerning the Lord's church. You know, uh, children need to see mom and dad, grandma and grandpas, or whoever it might be, Christians in general, they need to see them in the worship hour singing. Yeah, we talked about that last week. If you would, take your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, and we'll go back to Timothy. In verse 15, the Hebrew writer says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually, that is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Yes, not only do on Sundays do we come together and sing to our Lord, uh, give the sacrifice of our lips, the fruit of our lips, we should do that every day. But on Sunday is a day that God has called his people out, his family out. It's like a family reunion every Sunday. And God is wanting to hear from us praise and worship to him. This is God's day. This is a divine day, by the way. It's recorded in the Bible upon the first day of the week the disciples came together to break bread in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, the Bible says, don't forsake yourselves from the assembly as the manner of some is. It's a sin. But God, he has selected this day that his people would come out and honor him and worship him through his son Jesus. God sits upon the throne in heaven and his ears are tuned in and what he wants from his people is to sing praises to him, the fruit of our lips. Yes, that's why I wait when we are standing up and singing. I wait for everybody to get there because God wants everyone singing. God doesn't want anyone that's not singing. He wants everybody to sing. He wants us to open the hymn books if we're using them. Whatever songs that we're singing, God wants his people everyone singing. And that's a command. And if you're not singing, if we're not singing together and praising God, it's a sin. 
Sin is not just adultery and being a drunkard and a murderer. Sin is simply, in general, disobeying God, breaking His commands. That's what sin is. And so it's important. That's why I wait for everybody to get to the place that we all sing together so that you're not put in a position to sin against God. Back over in 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul wrote three letters that are recorded to evangelists. First and 2 Timothy and Titus. These are letters that Paul, that he wrote directly to Timothy and Titus, the evangelist. The apostles, Jesus gave them the authority Whatever they bound on earth would be bound in heaven. Whatever they loosed on earth would be loosed in heaven. Jesus gave them the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You find that in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 19. They had the keys to the kingdom of heaven. God, Jesus, gave the apostles the authority to take the word of God and rule over the church, command them. And so that's why Paul can write to Timothy and Titus and command them in the things that we find that are written in this letter. These letters are directly to Timothy and Titus, and then they, in turn, are to teach it to the congregation that they are presiding over. In 2 Timothy, in chapter 3, starting with uh, verse 14, Paul is talking about a young man and his mother and his grandmother, Lois and Eunice. And but he told him in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You can go back over in Timothy and you find out that uh, it was mom and grandma that taught him. <clears throat> and learn and has been assured of them of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child... Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures. In other words, Timothy, when he was a young man, he knew the Scriptures. You see? We need to be teaching the Scriptures to our children when they're young. Don't wait until they get older, but when they're young. That's what the Bible says. Our, because our kids are young doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to begin to understand and learn how to read and study the Bible. They learn other things, don't they? Yeah, sometimes our children today are smarter than adults. They learn other things. Why can't they learn the Bible? Especially the Bible because it is able to save their souls. It's important. And from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The Scriptures is God-breathed. The Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to write these letters to the church they are God-breathed. These men did not write down what they wanted to write down. They wrote down what the Holy Spirit directed them to write down. I'm telling you this morning that the Holy Spirit is the one who brought about the New Testament Scriptures. In Acts chapter 1, the Bible says that even Jesus... Starting with verse 1, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts, as also is the gospel count according to Luke. The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to both do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, speaking of Jesus, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. From Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22, every Scripture is by inspiration of God. The Bible is perfect. People aren't. 
That's why we have a problem with it. It's not God's fault. It's not the Bible's fault. It's our fault. You see, we need, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, we need to study to show ourselves approved unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. When we do that, we're allowing God to influence us. The Holy Spirit influences us. We're allowing the scriptures to influence us. Our minds and thoughts. You see, the Bible teaches it's, it's not a sin to worship, uh, eat with dirty hands. It's not what goes in that defiles a man. It's what comes out. Evil thoughts and murders and drunkenness. Evil thoughts is what comes out of the mind of man. But when we're influenced by the Word of God, there are no longer evil thoughts come out comes out glorious thoughts. Thoughts about Jesus Christ. Thoughts about the eternal kingdom. Thoughts that bring about to bring about a lost and dying world to Jesus. Our goal is the church. And our children need to see this. Okay, that's why I ask everyone staying here this morning. Our children need to see mom and dad, grandma and grandpa, aunts and uncles, Christians in general, that we truly believe what the Bible says. Our children, our grandchildren need to see that we believe what the Bible says and that we believe that it is the power of God unto salvation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jews first and then to the Greek. To everyone that believeth. It is the power of God unto salvation. And when the church is preaching and teaching the gospel, whether it be to multitudes or one-on-one, -on -one, whether it be on Facebook, the telephone, uh, the TV, the radio, where, however, the avenue that God has given us to do it, when we're teaching about Jesus Christ, His death and burial and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, the Bible says that the gospel is the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Every time that we preach and teach the gospel to someone, we are lifting Christ up. That's what they did when they crucified Him. They lifted Him up. The Bible says in the gospel account according to John, Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And he was speaking of the death that he should die. The Bible says that. So when we lift Jesus up, that means that we're preaching and teaching the gospel to people. And the Bible says that that is the power of God unto salvation. You see, there is no professor, there is no rich man, no president, no king that has any powerful words powerful enough to bring someone to Christ. Only the gospel can do it. Only the gospel of Jesus Christ can do that. And if we have loved ones who aren't Christians this morning, if we have friends who aren't Christians this morning, if we have no people that are lost and dying in the world, and we do, and we want to see them leave that kind of life and come to Christ and spend eternity with Him, I'm telling you, my friend, this morning that the church needs to start preaching the gospel. I know we get on the telephone and on Facebook and on the computer. I know we talk to people at work and everywhere we might be. And we get in all kinds of discussions about everything that don't mount to hell of beans. I'm telling you, when we're talking to people who are lost, we don't have to be talking about the, about the Lord's Supper. We don't need to be talking about the tithes and offerings. We need to be talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ because that is the power of God unto salvation. If you're a Christian this morning, you're a tool. You're a tool for God to use, okay? Not the devil. You're not for your own self. If you're a Christian this morning, you are a tool. The Bible says if you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God, then you must be a servant. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many.
And I'm telling you this morning, if you're a Christian, you're part of the Lord's church, you have a responsibility to be a tool for God to use. We're going to go into the springtime here in a few months. It's going to be time for planting. Farmers are going to go out and get their gardens ready. But they need tools to do that. Okay, so they go to the barn or the, wood shed, or the tool shed and they go in there. And what kind of shape is those tools in? Can they immediately take those tools and go out and, and uh, put out their gardens? Or do they need to be fixed a little bit? Be sharpened a little bit? Be greased a little bit? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then harvest comes. And then the, har uh, the farmer wants to harvest all that he planted. Well, he's got to go back to the tool shed again or the barn. And he's got to go in and see if his tools are prepared to get the job done. And I'm telling you this morning, if you're a Christian, you're a tool for the Lord. And he is that we are in the harvest time right now. It was harvest time back when uh, Jesus walked the earth in Matthew chapter 10 and 9. The Bible says that the harvest is already ripe and ready for the harvest. That's what it says. For 2,000 years, it's been ripe and ready for the harvest. And it's the responsibility of the Christian. God uses the Christian to go out and harvest, plant seeds and harvest. We need to be planting the seeds in the hearts of men. We may not win them to the Lord. It's not our job. Our job is to plant the seed. So it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, one plants, another waters, and who gives the increase? God does. God gives the increase. We just need to plant the seed and water it. That's our job. And God will bring about the harvest. What about you this morning, Christian? Are you in shape for, the, for God to use you as a tool? You know, the Word of God will influence us. That's why I stress. That's why I study the Word of God. It's because it influences me. There's a war going on. There's a war going on. God is trying to influence the world. And Satan also is trying to influence the world. You see? And see, God made us free moral agents. He didn't make us puppets. He let us, lets us choose and decide whom we're going to serve. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And I'm telling you, we have the Spirit and the flesh right here. And the Bible says that the one we feed the most will win out. If you feed the flesh the most, the flesh is going to win out in your life and you'll be lost eternally. But if you'll feed the Spirit, the Spirit will win out and you'll be saved for eternity. You see? Jesus went to the cross and laid His life down so that we could each spend eternity with Him someday. Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Whosoever will, Will you? Will you? <clears throat> In Jude, if you'll turn over with me, please. No, it's... Uh, <clears throat> Second Peter, chapter 1, verse 20 and following. Let's go back up to verse 17. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Peter said, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, speaking of Jesus, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And this voice came from heaven, we heard, when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, wherein ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place, until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, 
that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. These men were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the Scriptures. And you and I can put our trust in them. And we need to take heed of what we're hearing. You see, it's our responsibility, not God's. The Bible says in 2 Peter and chapter 1 that He's already given us everything that per- pertains to life and godliness. And that's through the knowledge of Jesus that we have that. If you turn over to Ephesians chapter 5 with me, please. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Verse 17 and following. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then let's go over to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Starting in verse 15, Paul's letter to the church at Colossae. He said, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of our Lord Jesus, giving thanks unto God and the Father by Him. We find that uh, on the first day of the week, the church comes together to sing. Not only on the first day of the week, but every day we ought to be singing praises to God. But on the first day of the week, we all have the responsibility to sing, as I said before. And what are we doing? The Bible says that we are teaching and admonishing one another. And we can sing in psalms, going back to the book of Psalms, and we do. And hymns, we sing in the hymn book this morning, and spiritual songs. You know, songs that you might go to the, the camp and sing, children's camp and sing. But we're to sing with grace in our hearts to the Lord. Yeah, psalmist is the Greek word uh, for that. And it's used the same way it was in the Old Testament. It says, used with uh, instrumental music. I know we have the non-instrumental church of Christ. And they teach that you, you, it's a sin to use instruments in the worship. But they use them other times. And the Bible teaches that the word psalmist is you sing with instrumental music. Just like they did in the Old Testament. And so, you go to the Greek, and you can find that. We had a church of Christ, non-instrumental church of Christ person come here one Wednesday night, and he said, it's okay me to sit down and have Bible study with you on Wednesday night, but I couldn't worship with you all because you have instruments in there. And we began, I remember Robert opened up the book that had the Greek in it and the Hebrew in it, and he started showing this man that, what that word meant in the Greek and the Hebrew. And it says, you do use instrumental music. He said, but that Greek and Hebrew book was made by man. But at the same time, I have gone to non-instrumental uh, churches of Christ, and even in their tracts, they use Greek and Hebrew books to prove out what they're saying. And so, that didn't hold any water. But I'm telling you this morning, the Bible says in Acts 2.42 that those Christians continue steadfast in the apostles' doctrine. We today should be still 
continuing in the apostles' doctrine. And not, any, not man's doctrine, not anybody else's doctrine, but the apostles' doctrine. And, you know, it's not my church, it's not any preacher's church, it's not any elder's church, it's the church that Jesus died for. It's His, it belongs to Him. And how, you know, Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And the church is the kingdom of God. And Jesus is our King. And He rules over His kingdom, the church, from heaven. How does He rule? Through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. This is how Jesus rules over us. I want you to know this morning that the apostles call themselves slaves, bond slaves. Now, people don't like that word today. But I'm glad I'm a slave to Jesus Christ. I'm glad I'm a bond slave to Jesus Christ. You know, because why? Because he died for me. He promised me eternal life with him someday if I'll be faithful unto him. And he's coming back to pick me up, you see, one day. Yes, I am a slave to Jesus Christ, and I'm proud of it. And I'll tell anybody that. And that's what we are today. We're slaves to Jesus Christ. And his word tells us what he wants. His word tells us how to please God. You know, that ought to be the goal of every Christian to please the one who died for us. Yeah, make him happy. You know, if I'm not never happy and I please God and make him happy, that's enough for me. If when Jesus comes back or I die and I stand before him and he says those great words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter the joys of thy Lord, that's going to be enough for me. You know, if he says those words to me, and I in this life suffer all kinds of persecution, and storms of life come my way, and Satan beats down upon me, when I stand before Jesus on judgment day, I'm going to say it was worth it all. See? It was worth it all. Oh, a hundred years is a long time, isn't it? No, it isn't. Not compared to eternity. A hundred years isn't nothing but a drop in a bucket compared to eternity. Yeah, you say, you mean I have to live a, be a Christian and live by the Bible for as long as I live? Absolutely. If you want to go to heaven, you do. But if you want to go to hell, shut it, throw it away, live the way you want to. But let me remind you, if you live the way you want to, my friend, you're living for the devil. You're serving him. And you're hurting people. We say we love people, huh? We say we want to help people, huh? Well, why don't you tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ? Why don't you study the Word of God and be a man of God and a woman of God like God wants you to be? Why don't you, when Jesus, when He was on the cross, His arms were spread out, and you know, that remember that song? It says, while He was on the cross, we were on His mind. Isn't it time for Christians today to quit feeling sorry for themselves? Quit worrying about this and that. Quit worrying about the bills. Quit diving into the, the doom and gloom and the dark and evils of this world and take a good dive into the goodness of God. Yes. God wants us to be happy. God wants us to have joy in our hearts. And He wants the lost and dying world to see that in us as they seen it in Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 11. <clears throat> in the early church, <clears throat> the Bible bears this out. When there was teaching and preaching going on, everybody had their Bibles open. Because they were not going to allow any man to deceive them. They weren't going to allow any man or any person to lie to them concerning God. They weren't going to allow them to be preached and taught to false doctrine. They were warned in the Scriptures, and there were many Christians that took heed to that warning, and they would not allow anybody to deceive them. Don't you know, Christian? You may not like to hear this, but you're here this morning, and wherever Christians are in this world today, 
And there are preachers and elders teaching the Word of God. Do you know, if you're not following along, that that's a sin? Wow, I didn't know that, preacher. You mean, you mean I have to have my Bible open? And, and you mean I have to follow along? <laughs> you better believe it. Because I'll tell you this morning, I'm just a man. And I'll let you down. I could be a, t a false teacher too. You never know it. I could be a, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I could be saying just enough truth to deceive you. And you'd never know it. Unless you were studying God's Word. You see, people that study God's Word when false preaching is uh, being brought out, the red lights go off in their head. The bells go off in their head. That's not right. If I was to tell you this morning that you didn't have to be baptized to be saved, I'm telling you the red lights ought to be going off in your head like this. Bam, 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 bam. Because you know that's not the truth. They continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread. Robert read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's read it again, starting in verse 23. Now let's move back up. In verse 17, Now in this, Paul said to the church at Corinth, there were many problems in the church at Corinth, but Paul stuck with them because why? He loved them. Second letter of Corinthians was written because they came out of it. They started obeying God. It says in verse 17, Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must also be heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, in one place, now he's talking about a particular group of Christians and what they were doing when they came together. <clears throat> when you come together, therefore, in one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in eating, everyone taketh before the other his own supper, and one is hungry, and other is drunken. What? Have you not houses to eat and drink in, or despise ye the church of God? And shame them that have not. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. The church was coming together to take the Lord's Supper, but look how they were doing it. There were those who were hungry, and they had none. There were those who were going ahead and eating before the others in front of them. There were those who were, as the Catholics do, using fermented wine and drinking and getting drunk. You know, Paul didn't just wipe them off. He taught them what the Bible says, the Word of God. I'm telling you this morning that there's power in the Word of God. And there's not power in Jay's Word. I can tell people this and that from A to Z. There's no power in it. But when I tell them about the Word of God, there's power in it, you see. It changes people's lives. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 bears that out. They were coming together and they were uh, mocking God concerning the Lord's Supper. But in verse 23, Paul said to the church at Corinth and to us today, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he is betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he come. The church came together not only to sing, but to partake of the Lord's Supper. Every Christian, there is no reason for a Christian not to be around the Lord's table on the Lord's day unless you are so sick you can't get up and go. Unless there is a trees falling on your house you can't get out. Unless there is a flood and you're about to drown. You understand what I'm saying? Every Christian ought to love the Lord Jesus Christ enough to bring around the Lord's table on the first day of the week. Come together with God's family. We need encouragement. We need to encourage one another. 
Lo and behold, we're the people that are going to spend eternity with one another sometime if we're faithful unto the end. We are the people we want to be around. We don't want to be around worldly people other than to teach them about Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Turn over there. Paul said to the church at Rome in Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1, he says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We have a responsibility to do that as a Christian. What's the purpose for it? To show a lost and dying world that we believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that He's coming back one day like He promised. Paul said to the church at Corinth in chapter 11 that... <clears throat> This is my body, which is broken for you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood. It says, drink ye it in remembrance of me. Now, when we partake of this here bread, it's not truly the body of Jesus. It would be cannibals if it was. But it represents the body of Jesus. We partake of this cup. It is called the fruit of the vine. It is not called fermented wine. Wine is when the grape is on the vine until whatever they do with it later. It's wine which's on the vine and afterwards. That's what grape juice is. And that's what we partake on Sunday morning is grape juice through the vine, not wine that makes a person drunk like the Catholics use. And he said, do this in remembrance of me. Every Lord's Day, we come around the table and partake of this. Why? Well, first of all, the Bible says so. That's why. That's good enough for me. If God said to do it, the one who's going to take me home with him, that's good enough for me, my friend. Another reason is, in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says they continued in this, this apostle's doctrine, breaking your bread. And on the first day of the week, the disciples came together to break bread. This is what God approved. This is what come down from heaven. You see, people want to see heaven. You know, we have these scientists who got these great telescopes and they can see far out. And they're claiming they see other galaxies and they see big holes in space. That which they really don't know what they're talking about. People see, say they see spiritual angels. They don't know what they're talking about. People say God speaks to them verbally today. They don't know what they're talking about. Because God has declared that. We have the Word of God to know what God wants. And through Jesus, He tells us what He wants. I'm a child of God. He's my Father in Heaven. He loves me because He's my Father in Heaven. He wants what's best for me. You see, He cares for me just like He does you. He wants to see that I have everything that I need. He wants to help me all that He can. He wants to bless me all that He can. And He wants to provide for me. He wants me to be happy and He wants me to have joy. Well, why wouldn't I love someone like that? Why wouldn't I love someone? Do you know when Jesus went to the cross, the Bible says in the book of Romans, that while we were yet his enemies, <laughs> we know what enemies are, right? While we were yet his enemies, he died for us, or he died for the ungodly. I'm telling you, I was an enemy of God before I was baptized into Christ. I sinned and I loved it. I liked my rock and roll music. And if you would have said something about my rock and roll music, we would have been fighting. I love that lifestyle. And I didn't want to listen to no preacher. Didn't want no one telling me what to do. And no one did tell me what to do until I went to jail. But now 
I see it differently. Why? Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, the Bible says that the Word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And it could cut asunder the body and spirit, even the bone and the marrow. It can cut that way. And it opens things up to God, the Father in heaven, and makes known unto Him what's wrong with my life. And you see, by studying God's Word, by hearing the Gospel, I'm glad someone loved me enough to come and bring the Gospel to me. But it's sad, that person that brought the Gospel to me is no longer a Christian, no longer serves God. Be careful that don't happen to you. But I'm glad that person brought the gospel to me. You know why? Because God began changing me, influencing me. And I seen the error of my way, and I didn't want to live like that any longer. So I went headlong with God in the Word of God. And I growed in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I become a walking Bible. I was dumb. I never did really had know how to read and start start reading the Bible. I was illiterate. And I jumped full swing into the Bible. And I made a commitment to God that I was going to serve Him until I die. Just like I made a commitment to my wife, I'm going to be married to her until death do us part. Why would I even say something like that? Because of this right here. I was baptized into Christ, I believe it was about 1978 or 1979. And I've been serving the Lord ever since. I'm just as excited now as I was then. I never thought I'd ever be a preacher. I'm saying this for a reason. I never thought I'd be a preacher. You know, people told me when I was a teenager, look, look that person, he'll never get married. And lo and behold, look what happened. I never, I never thought I could ever be a preacher. I was so dumb by the first, in, the, in the first place. Now look at me. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an evangelist for the Lord. And what I'm saying this is, you can be two. You can be a man for God and a woman for God. And that's why Paul's talking about here in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that in partaking of the Lord's Supper or anything that you do for the Lord... Don't do it the worldly way. Don't do it the way you think it ought to be. You better do it the way the Scriptures teach it. Because there's two things that take place as I close this morning. And I'm going to pick back up next Sunday morning and talking about why does the church come together on the first day of the week. You'll either please God or you'll make Him angry. There's no in-between. God just says, well, that person ain't going to listen to me. I'm just not going to think about it. No. The wrath of God's going to come down on all those that live ungodly. It's going to happen one day. You see? And we need to be prepared for that. The Bible says, don't fear them that can kill the body, but fear him that kill both body and soul in hell's fire. Trouble today is people don't fear God anymore. They're not afraid of what he can do. They don't not worry about what's going to happen. Jesus is coming back. You know what? All of us are going to die. All of us are going to die of something sometime. You can take it to the bank. It's going to happen. You're not going to escape it. And you're going to go spend eternity somewhere. You see, you're not just going to die and go to the grave and that's it. Your spirit is going to spend eternity somewhere. It's either going to be with God in heaven or with the devil in hell. And what's so good about it is God doesn't make me do anything. We don't like that word, make me. Or we don't like that word, obey. I know my mother, if you told her she couldn't do something, she'd break her neck to do it. And we're like that a lot of times. You see, we're all going to die. 
or Jesus comes back. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2 that every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. My friend, if you don't do it now, you'll be made to do it in heaven when you stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be made to bow and confess. My question to you this morning, why would you want to be made to do that when you should love the one who died for you enough to bow for him now and confess him now? What about you this morning? If you're not a Christian this morning, the Bible says you need to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. By believing that message, one repents of their sins. Repentance is a change of mind and conduct toward the way that you're living and turn towards God. The Bible says one must be baptized by immersion so that your sins can be washed away and receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Not to help you speak in tongues and do miracles, but to help you live a faithful life unto Jesus and His Word unto the end. If you are a Christian this morning and God's speaking to you through His Word and the Holy Spirit, that's the way He does it. You know you're not living the way God wants you to. That's sin, my friend. You don't obey God and keep His commandments. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. If you're not studying God's Word, you don't know what His commands are. So how could you love Him? That's sin, my friend. Disobeying God is sin. And the Bible says you need to repent. Repentance is not a bad word. Repentance is an avenue that God gives a Christian to come back to Him. See, that's good news. 1 John 1, 9, the Bible says, If we, the Christian, will confess our sins to Him, Jesus, He is just and He's faithful to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's good news. You see, God doesn't forget about us when we sin. He calls us to repentance and He gives us a way to come back to Him, you see. What about you this morning? Do you have a decision to make? Why don't you do that as we stand and sing? I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in His arms. In the arms of Christ my Savior.